Oh, good afternoon. Um, before I start, if you're wondering why I have uh, an American flag on my back wall, I am technically American and uh, my father was a submarine commander in the US Navy uh, and that's the flag that flew over his boat. Anyway, enough about him. In the last lecture, we talked about um, genetic information and how genetic information was organized and passed from parents to offspring. That's Mendelian genetics. What we'd like to think about this lecture is what are the actual physical things in the cell that carry that genetic information? This process of assigning a physical unit to a genetic unit is called physical mapping. I should stress that Mendel's work was not the driver for a lot of this. Mendel's work was actually published and then forgotten about for 30 or 40 years and picked up again around about 1900. But at the same time, or, or during that period rather, um, a lot of work had been done on cytology, which is the study of how cells behave. Uh, this is all microscopic work. And that in, in 1900, when Mendel's work was rediscovered, it was realized that a lot of that cytological work had a direct bearing on the, um, the nature of the genes that Mendel had, had postulated. We now know that cells have a life cycle and that life cycle has four main phases. G1, S phase, G2 and M phase. And I'll explain what each of those phases are. G1 is the, uh, stands for gap one, G1 is the phase in which most cells are, most normal resting eukaryotic cells are in G1, just going about their business. Some cells receive signals that, and these signals are things like growth hormones, receive signals telling them to divide. And the first thing they do when they receive these signals is they enter S phase. S stands for synthesis, DNA synthesis phase. And all that happens is the DNA in the nucleus replicates. So you now have one cell with a nucleus that has twice as much DNA as it normally does in. After S phase comes G2, gap two phase. And G2 is, um, is basically the cell taking a break. It's done all this hard work synthesizing DNA and uh, is now having a rest. And after G2 comes M phase. M stands for mitosis. And this is the phenomenon that was discovered back in around about 18, 1880, 1870, um, uh, in which a um, chap called Walter Fleming used a dye, aniline dye, to stain cells and then follow the cells under the microscope. Now he noticed that at certain stages of the cell cycle, which we now call M phase mitosis, at certain stages he could actually see very densely colored bodies in the nucleus. And he called these chromosomes. Chromos a chromosome simply means a colored body. Chromos is colored, um, as in chromatography, and uh, som somos is body, uh, as in a somatic cell. So chromosomes are simply colored bodies. And what Walter Fleming noticed was that these chromosomes behaved in a very interesting fashion. They, um, and he, he split mitosis up into a number of subphases, which were uh, designated according to the behavior of the chromosomes. The first phase was called prophase, in which the chromosomes just became visible. So within the nucleus, Fleming could see tiny little strands, uh, which we now know are the chromosomes condensing. Uh, and I should say that usually you can't see chromatin, so DNA plus protein, you can't see it in the nucleus. It's, it's very loosely packed. Only during mitosis does the chromatin become very densely packed. And we'll understand why in a moment. So in prophase, you can first start seeing the chromosomes to contract. The next phase is called prometaphase. And during prometaphase, the nuclear membrane surrounding the nucleus breaks down. 
The next phase is called metaphase. During metaphase, all of the chromosomes line up along what is called the equatorial plate. It's an imaginary line down the middle of the nucleus. Following that lining up at metaphase, each chromosome pulls itself in half. One half goes to one end of the cell, one half goes to the other end of the cell. This is called anaphase. And there is a, um, the machinery that pulls the chromosomes apart is called the spindle. Finally, the final phase of, of mitosis is telophase. And during telophase, the events of prophase and prometaphase are reversed. So you have now two sets of chromosomes at opposite ends of the cell, and a new nuclear membrane forms around each of those daughter nuclei. Telophase is then followed by cytokinesis, in which the cell actually rips itself in half, leaving two daughter, two, two daughter cells, each with a daughter nucleus, each with the same number of chromosomes as the original parent had. Now, what is interesting about chromosomes was uh, work that followed this up by somebody called Theodore Bovary. Bovary was working on sea urchin embryos, uh, and he took sea urchin eggs, and sea urchin eggs can be fertilized by, well, they're normally fertilized by one sea urchin sperm, but sometimes they can be fertilized by two sea urchin sperm. This is something called polyspermy. A polyspermic sea urchin zygote has too many chromosomes, and the zygote doesn't know how to divide these up. So when it comes to metaphase, telophase, and then cytokinesis, what often happens is that daughter cells end up with the wrong number of chromosomes. And Bovary realized that if a daughter cell had the wrong number of chromosomes, it wouldn't develop properly. This is extremely interesting because it means that a cell needs the correct number of chromosomes in order to develop properly. And that immediately made Bovary realize that the chromosomes must carry some kind of information that determined how a cell develops. In order for a cell to develop properly, it must have a complete set of information that is carried by a complete set of chromosomes. Now remember, Mendel's work had not yet been rediscovered when Bovary did this, so Bovary didn't realize, or he didn't link his chromosomes with genes. He just thought that there must be some information that the chromosomes carried. But his work refocused attention on exactly what chromosomes are make people take a much closer look at the structure of chromosomes. And you can see on your screen now a very um, simple structure of a chromosome that cytologists came up with. And this is now a um, chromosome after telophase. So this is the chromosome, once it's torn itself in half, this is the half that makes its way into the daughter cell. It's simply a linear strand of chromatin, and we now know that chromatin is a... a um, strand of DNA wrapped around histone protein. So chromatin is a DNA plus protein complex. It's a linear strand uh, of chromatin with a constriction in the middle that is called the centromere. I should say that the strand of DNA that makes up the chromosome is double, double helical. So you have a, a double helix of DNA, a linear piece of double helical DNA. The um, finer structure was given to that basic chromosome model by the subsequent work of cytologists who used various stains to look at the fine structure of chromosomes. And in particular, they used a stain called the Giemza stain, which stained regular bands, uh, dark and light bands, along the length of a chromosome. You can see a picture here of what G -staining, a G-stained chromosome looks like. The light bands are called euchromatin, the dark bands are called heterochromatin. What's extremely interesting is that cytologists noticed that chromosomes came in pairs. And what I mean by that is the G banding pattern of a particular chromosome is characteristic of that chromosome. So if you look at two different chromosomes, they will have different G-banding patterns. The light and the dark bands will be in different places. 
However, um, there are pairs of chromosomes. So in the human cell are 46 chromosomes, and it turns out that two of them have the same banding pattern. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, there are two particular chromosomes in that 46 that have the same banding pattern. They are paired. And these are called homologous pairs. There's then another two that have a different banding pattern, and another two that have a third banding pattern, another two that have a fourth banding pattern, and so on all the way down until we find that there are 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes in the normal human cell. This is extremely interesting because it immediately brings to mind Mendel's idea of alleles. If you have um, two alleles in each cell, one from your mother and one from your father, that matches the idea that you have two homologous chromosomes. One chromosome could be from your mother and one could be from your father. So that's very interesting, very suggestive. And um, if we jump ahead, uh, I, meant, I mentioned that chromosomes are only seen at uh, M phase because they condense. And in fact, it turns out that chromosomes are a way of packing a, D, a, a, a genome. So if we jump ahead now, we know that there are, in each of your normal cells, there are two copies of a genome. One genome from your father and one genome from your mother. Each genome has information arranged in the same order. And these bits of information we know from the last lecture are the gene loci. At, uh, in your, in the, the copy of the genome that comes from your mother, there are particular alleles at these gene loci, the maternal alleles. In the copy of your genome that comes from your father, there are a different set of alleles. So you are heterozygous. Now, the human genome is a very big thing. Each of those copies, the copy from your mother, the copy from your father, is very long, and it's too long for the cell to really handle properly. So evolution has split each genome, your maternal genome and your paternal genome, up into smaller packages. And these packages are the chromosomes. You can see this on your screen now. The Chromosomes are um, structured, or, or sorry, the, the, the breaking up of the maternal and paternal genomes into chromosomes is done in the same way. And this is the basis for the fact that they're homologous. So the information on the first chromosome that is uh, sliced off the paternal genome is the same as the information on the first chromosome sliced off the maternal genome. So Paternal and maternal genomes are broken in 23 bits. Those bits are the chromosomes. 23 bits from your maternal and paternal make 23 pairs of chromosomes, which are the homologous pairs. And you can see that on your screen. When each of those chromosomes replicates during S phase, the they give rise to what are called chromatids. It's very confusing, this jargon. So you have one um, chromosome from your mother and one chromosome from your father. Those are the, that, that, those two chromosomes make up a homologous pair. When they replicate, each chromosome doubles. Now, these two bits on what to you will be my left hand, those two things, those two copies, are sister chromatids of that chromosome. Similarly, these two fingers that I'm now waving are sister chromatids of the other chromosome. These two chromosomes are, are homologous chromosomes, and they have each divided into sister chromatids. The... Um, There should, well, there are then two questions remaining, and we'll address these two questions in the next lecture. Those two questions are, first of all, mitosis gives um, equal numbers of chromosomes to daughter cells. So you start off with a parental cell with 46 chromosomes, 
you end up with two daughter cells with 46 chromosomes. That doesn't match, or that doesn't tally with Mendel's principle of segregation, in which he said that one allele from the parent, or only one allele from the parent, made its way into the gamete. So mitosis does not give the pattern of segregation that Mendel needed for alleles into gametes. And the spoiler is that mitosis is not the process that gives rise to gametes. We'll find out more about that in the next lecture. The second thing we need to think about, the second question that it raises, is that there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. There are 46 chromosomes in all in a human cell, but there are clearly far more genes than 23. So each chromosome must carry more than one gene. And this, um, this leads us on to the phenomenon of linkage, which we will look at in the next lecture. I'll just finish by saying that um, talk about physical mapping a little bit more. The first physical mapping was done by Bovary, and he linked the most basic phenotype, which is life. He said, life requires this complement of chromosomes. Probably the next most basic phenotype is the distinction between male and female sexes. And the next bit of physical mapping was done in the early 1900s, about 1905, I think, by two scientists, um, Wilson and Stevens. And they used... Um, chromosome spreads to uh, identify sex chromosomes. They noticed that females had two chromosomes that looked the same, XX, whereas males had um, a homologous pair of chromosomes that looked slightly, slightly different, the X and the Y. So the first real uh, example of physical mapping was the use of chromosome spreads to identify the physical units responsible for a particular trait, sex. And we'll talk more about that in future lectures.